Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to Choose You at HQ. And uh, here's a session on monetary policy. Uh, we covered economic cycles in the previous session. And we also have some live sessions coming up on fiscal policy and also on supply side policies and inequality, together with special on the UK economy and then a kind of general revision warm up session ahead of paper two. Hopefully, these sessions are useful for you. If you're watching live, we love, absolutely love, your contributions in the chat window they are amazing and they're really very helpful for everybody else because the quality of the answers is so good if you're watching on catch up then you can press some press the pause button anytime especially if you get a question have a think about it drop down some answers and then we'll go through the answers together if it's okay with you let's start with our favorite bubble quiz so this is on monetary policy and uh, our bubble quiz those of you who are fans of it the number of answers that are correct can range from zero to all four. Let's try these, post the answers in the chat window. Which of these countries have used negative interest rates as part of their monetary policy in recent years? Okay, Japan, Germany, Denmark, Switzerland. That would be quite a hard, hard qualifying group if it was the World Cup. Which of these countries have used negative interest rates as part of their monetary policy? What do we think? The answers are flying through. I'll try and pick out some. Uh, Kira thinks A, um, gosh, Thompson Jones says B, Joshua says A, C, and D. Uh, Alex says B, Alex says all of them, Germany with the E, C, B. Interesting. Uh, yeah, okay. Hannah says A, C, D. I'll go with the answer coming through. I've gone for A, C, D. Technically, the E, C, B did dally. They dallied. I love that word, by the way. They dallied with negative interest rates for a very, very short period of time. Although it was a, it was only one specific interest rate rather than the one main policy rate. Japan, Denmark, Switzerland have all used negative interest rates. Worth in your revision notes, just having one or two examples, just one or two, it's all you need of countries that have gone below the floor, below the nominal floor, and gone for negative interest rates. And hopefully that uh, gives you some, some examples there. Let's try another question. Here it is. This is a harder question. Which of these countries do not operate, in other words, don't have a managed floating exchange rate as part of their monetary policy? So which of these countries don't have a managed floating exchange rate as part of monetary policy? And the key thing is the exchange rate is part of monetary policy in an economic context. What do we think? Uh, Lanine says D and C. Hugo thinks it's A. Uh, which, uh, Alex says D and C. Which of these countries uh, do not operate with a managed floating exchange rate? Okay. In other words, which of these countries, if you think they have a managed floating exchange rate, then the answer is, is wrong. Maybe the question, the word question, the wording has come out. Not D. So, uh, okay. Jacob says D and B. Kira says A and B. Let's look at the answer. It's the UK. The UK is the only country in that little list there that doesn't have a managed floating exchange rate. The UK is a free floating exchange rate, and it hasn't, the Bank of England has not intervened directly in the markets, not intervened since September 1992. Uh, Brazil and Turkey and South Korea, they all have managed floating exchange rates to a lesser or greater degree. And that's really quite important. And the next slide hints at that. If a country is operating a managed floating exchange rate, then the central bank obviously has to use interest rates occasionally, perhaps to bring about a currency depreciation, they would cut interest rates, or an appreciation if they would raise interest rates. So therefore, a managed floating exchange rate system, interest rates and the exchange rates are much more closely linked because the exchange rate becomes an instrument of policy, a way of manipulating demand and supply. And it's altering the exchange rate is commonly regarded as a type of monetary policy that is definitely worth revising for paper two. At Excel students, exchange rates, I think, appear on paper three, but you should definitely revise them out of paper two because they have a big effect on the economy. Here's my next question. Uh, general knowledge question. Which of these countries currently have monetary policy interest rates higher than 10%? And this is as the last time I looked, which was about nine o'clock this morning. Which of these countries currently have monetary policy interest rates set by their central banks higher than 10%? What do we think? Hugo says A and C. Paddy says A. 
Leah says A. Jacob says D. Alex Belay says A, B, C. Michael Everard says C. And Mabil says C and D. Okay, what do we reckon? Well, let's look at the answers. Here they come. A, B, and C. Congratulations to Big Wings. He got that right, or she got that right. Uh, Albie said A and B, but missed out on C. And uh, Jay said A and C, but missed out on P. Yeah, Turkish interest rates are coming down. Of course, Erdogan's trying to persuade the central bank, or trying to force the central bank, to cut interest rates whilst inflation's going up. It's a battle royal taking place. I think he's got through about six central bank governors in the last nine months. He's got through more central bank governors than Sunderland have got through managers in the last few seasons. Indian interest rates are a little bit below 10%, but not much below. Uh, the reason for adding this in as a question, there are three good examples of countries for your revision notes that have high interest rates. Just You don't have to know the number, but if you get a question on UK interest rates compared with other countries, Argentina, Turkey and Brazil have high interest rates. Um, maybe one more. Have we got time for one more? Yes. So the technical question. Uh, which of these would be classified as an expansionary monetary policy? I'll give you a clue here. Some of the right answers start with the words central bank. I don't know if that's helpful or not. Which of these, A, B, C, D, 1, 2, 3, 4, or none of them, would be classified as an expansionary monetary policy? Henry says interest rates are set by the government, right? No, Henry, interest rates are set by the central bank which in most countries, not all, but most countries, is largely independent of the government. Alex goes A, B, D. Uh, Bessant says C. Ranim says A, B, C. Uh, J goes A, B, D. A, B, D. And let's have a couple more. Sagar says A, C, D. And Ria says A, B, C, D. Hannah says A, B, D. Let's check. Well done to those who got that right, including Hannah. A, B, and D are right. Central bank cutting interest rates negative. That's clearly expansionary. Uh, intervening to cause a currency depreciation in a managed floating system. That's expansionary monetary policy. And the one on the right there, allowing commercial banks to hold less cash. So if I put money in a bank, I say I put £1,000 in the bank, the bank will hold some back in cash just as a kind of insurance bit of precaution. If, this, if the Bank of England says you, to the bank, you don't have to hold much in cash or less, that means the bank can lend out uh, the vast majority. In fact, during the first year of the, of the pandemic, the Bank of England cut the cash to deposits ratio, I think basically to zero for banks, so that banks could continue lending out to people. C is wrong. C is what's called reverse quantitative easing, where the central bank sells bonds to the banks the banks pay for those bonds in cash, and that reduces the liquidity of the banking system. So C is quantitative tightening, as Master 475 says, clearly a master of his or her economics. Great answer. Okay, let's move on. So uh, I just think context is important here. We've been through the pandemic. Gosh, we've been through a lot, haven't we? Monetary policy did, did, play a role. Monetary policy did help to support the UK economy during the pandemic. Bank of England cut interest rates close to the floor. They cut them from 0.75% to 0.1%. Now, some people might say that's a slash in interest rates. It's not. That's just the, it's less than 1%. Of course, the key valuation point here is that the Bank of England didn't have much room for manoeuvre. They kept interest rates very low after the last recession the global financial crisis, interest rates didn't go up back to normal levels of, let's say, 3 4 5%. And therefore, when the pandemic hit us, uh, there was no room for the Bank of England really to move on interest rates. It's quite an interesting evaluation point that oftentimes central banks need to move interest rates up in order to bring them down again, sort of Duke of York strategy, if you like. And the Bank of England wasn't in that position in 2020. What they did do, though, of course, they expanded QE dramatically by £400 billion. 450 billion pounds plus we'll talk about qe and evaluate that in just a few minutes but the bank money policy did help did help the economy but in i think in, in large part fiscal policy was the biggest support during the pandemic 
And I'll talk a lot more about fiscal policy in the next live session, if you're with me on that. However, this is a good example to use of what's called counter cyclical demand side policy. So when the economy goes into, goes into a downspin, monetary policy expands to try and stabilize the economy and prevent a deflationary depression. Okay, uh, here's the data uh, for the UK showing uh, interest rates, just to, just so you're aware of it. Somebody was saying in the live stream, they wanted a few more stats on the economy. So base rates are currently 1% and they have been as low as 0.1%. What I've done in the next slide is superimpose on that chart inflation. And you can see here what's happened to CPI inflation. Well, inflation in the UK is now way above, well above target. It's currently 9%. And interest rates starting to go up. But the gap now between inflation and interest rates is the highest it's been for, gosh, certainly two or three decades. The next slide shows the Bank of England's forecast for inflation. And they're predicting that inflation will rise, uh, peaking probably around 10, 10, 11 percent by the end of the year. And then they always predict that inflation falls back towards the target level, because if they didn't predict that, their, their monetary policy isn't correct. But they, they expect that inflation will back to back to be 2 percent, but it might take two or three years for that to happen. And I think inflation forecast for next year for the UK is about 5 percent. Now, crucially, the next slide provides a bit of context on that. So I think the surge in inflation in the last year or two uh, is a big challenge for monetary policy in the UK. Inflation is four times the inflation target of 2%. Base rates are going up. The Bank of England is starting to tighten interest rates, but quite a few people think that it's not, they're not moving quickly enough. In other words, that here's an evaluation phrase for you. They argue that monetary policy is lagging the cycle, the inflation cycle the base rate should be rising more quickly. Here's an article from today's Times on the next slide. Uh, Andrew Sentence, I was, at, I was at college, I was at university with, with Andrew Sentence. We both studied economics at the same time. And Andrew Sentence, former Bank of England economist, is arguing for 3% interest rates in the UK to halt runaway inflation. So 3% compared to 1% is, a, is quite a big change in the context of the last 10 years. Over to you, everybody. Uh, this is where we get some amazing answers from our team of economists, truly amazing. We'll pick out some of the best ones. 30 seconds, can you give me some arguments for the Bank of England raising interest rates? Over to you. Okay, some great answers. And uh, as we always do on these sessions, we try and pick out some of the super contributions on the screen to help people, particularly those who are watching on replay where the live stream isn't available, or the, the, the chat. Here's a, a lovely answer from Naomi Scott. Raising interest rates will reduce demand for inflation, reducing the erosion of real incomes. Wow. It will increase certainty and confidence from businesses and consumers. So Naomi, Naomi there is arguing that high inflation generates uncertainty economic volatility, which if you don't nip it in the bud, uh, can be damaging to investment, for example. So raising interest rates now, Sochi says, acts as a behavioral nudge to reduce consumption. That's, it's not really a behavioral nudge in the sense it's actually a financial move. It's a, you could argue it's nudging them. Actually, it's probably best known as monetary fine tuning. Somebody actually mentioned a brilliant point about um, interest rates in, in, um, causing the exchange rate to go up. And the Bank of England kind of knows this. Free floating exchange rate, yes, but it knows that high interest rates will impact on the exchange rate. Joshua's got a great point here. An increase in interest rates would increase the cost of borrowing, disincentivize people to take out loans, consumption will decrease, AD will shift inwards, nice use of the diagram there. I think Joshua and inflation and pressure will go down. Wow, well done. And, and there's so many contributions, we're just trying to be selective. Can I pick out three for you? Uh, yes, I think. The case for raising interest rates is pretty nailed on, isn't it? You need to control demand, pull inflationary pressure. With inflation at 9%, if you're not moving on interest rates now, when will you move on interest rates? Although the Bank of England thinks the inflation rise is temporary, uh, the answer is it's not. 
Secondly, I think a really key point, can I stress this for you? Uh, rising interest rates probably needed to weaken house price inflation, take some of the steam out of the housing market, because there was a major issue of housing affordability, which higher interest rates and higher mortgages could, could um, address. And crucially, there were millions of people out there who were savers, and savers get badly hit by inflation. The real return is negative. So higher interest rates, in theory, improve returns for savers, but it depends on whether the, the banks pass on higher interest rates to their savers in the form of deposit rates. So well done on that, superb answers as always. Uh, okay, well let's, let's tilt this evaluation. 30 seconds, please. Arguments against the Bank of England raising interest rates at the moment. Over to you. is like being in one of those macroeconomic masterclasses where I'm, I'm the student and you're the teacher. This is remarkable. Uh, I think, yeah, some great answers coming through. Here's Master 475. Reduce disposable income for those on variable mortgage rates, increasing unemployment, less real GDP, AD shifting to the left. Some great answers. A lot of people saying it could be regressive, particularly those still trying to pay off debt from the, from the last recession. Freddie says it causes an increase in the exchange rate. Exactly right, Fred. I'd use the word appreciation, just tiny, tiny word change there, which leads to lower international competitiveness, maybe decreasing growth. Uh, some great points here. Can we get one more? Daniel, Daniel Piper says a reduction in investment resulting in less innovation and R&D spending, damaging long-term growth prospects. Wow, fantastic. So utterly amazing answers there. Uh, let me pick out my three points. Again, so many one could talk about. Hopefully these points might be helpful to you. For, to you. Case for raising interest rates to let's say three percent. Andy sentence saying three uh, percent. Andrew, by the way, is known as an inflation hawk. He, he he doesn't like high inflation and tends to move on interest rates fairly quickly. The big risks are you could cause a consumer recession, especially as we talked about in the previous session today. If, we, if the economy is facing stagflation, there is a genuine risk, by the way, of of a consumer recession in the second half of this year. Nice point point to it might lead to a fall in business capital investment. Businesses holding back on investment projects, which could then harm long-term growth. And crucially, it does risk causing an increase in bankruptcy, uh, distressed, financial distress among particularly very highly indebted com consumers and small businesses. Lewis asks an important question. How old are you, Jeff? The answer is older than I would even dare to dream is possible. And I remember what I was saying, Lewis, when the 1930s depression affected me very, very deeply. Uh, Eddie says, Jeff went to the uni during the Great Depression, do the maths. Correct. Of course, I was a mature student when I went to university. Key point coming up. This is a really key evaluation point. If some of you use this in the exam on Monday, I'll be chuffed a bit. The Bank of England does not set market interest rates. Now, this is really important. Two things to avoid. One is writing the government sets interest rates because it doesn't. When anybody who writes that should get zero. The Bank of England does not set market interest rates. The Bank of England sets the base rate of interest or the policy rate or the bank rate, whatever you want to call it. They set the base rate. That then sends a signal to the rest of the financial markets that they want other interest rates to change, to move up or to move down. This chart taken from the Bank of England's inflation report which, by the way, is an absolutely cracking read on a, on a Thursday morning, I'm telling you. Just shows things like mortgage rates. So LTV, by the way, is loan to valuation rate. So if you've got a 90% LTV, a £500,000 house, you get a mortgage of whatever it is, uh, £470,000, £450,000. Uh, LTV is low. If you, if, you, if you have a bigger deposit, it comes down to 75%, you get a cheaper mortgage. And look at the fixed saving bond. It's paying 1% interest. That's pathetic. I mean, think about the real interest rates for savers at the moment. And an instant access deposit account pays on average in the UK about 0.15%. It 
If you're saving in that account, you are literally giving your money away to inflation. But the key point is the Bank of England does not set interest rates. It sets one interest rate. Now, the next chart, I think, is really quite interesting. When you go into the exam on Monday, interest rates are going up, but consumer confidence is going down. Consumer confidence, which is measured a kind of survey measure, is now at its lowest level for 40 years. And in part, it's because people are taking a bit of a hit to their real post tax income, higher taxes, wages falling behind inflation. So consumer confidence is very low. Now, you could use that as an evaluation point. Uh, the case for the Bank of England raising interest rates at a time when consumer confidence is very fragile increases the risks of a recession would be a nice phrase to use, wouldn't it? Okay, a uh, bit of exam gold. Again, I just want to scatter uh, some exam gold in your direction. Cent so one, Bank of England doesn't, doesn't set the vast majority of interest rates. Okay, the second point, central banks do not determine the inflation rate directly. So please don't write on Monday, a rise in interest rates will reduce inflation. Or the Central Bank of England increases interest rates to reduce inflation. No, Bank of England does not determine the inflation rate. The inflation rate is influenced by so many different internal and external factors. Uh, interest rates can influence actual and expected inflation, but interest rates do not, and I'm, I really want to stress this, do not directly determine inflation. The central bank can influence inflationary pressure, but businesses set prices, not the Bank of England. And again, hopefully that's a useful evaluation point. In that vein, one more, couple more for you. Can you give me two external factors that increase the rate of inflation in the UK economy? External factors, 30 seconds, have a go. Yeah, Thompson Jones, supply side shocks, great answer. As, as always, the answers are flying through. Many of you talking about supply side shocks, many of you talking about uh, tragic events in Ukraine and uh, uh, including the Evergreen blocking the Suez Canal. Yeah, it just took a one, took a, took a long turn, didn't they? Blocked the Suez Canal for a week or so. <laughs> Interestingly, when the Evergreen went aground, the first reaction, I think, of the authorities was to get a bloke with a shovel to try to move it. Um, it needed a slightly bigger capital stock. Uh, here's a great phrase you could use in the exam, um, uh, discussing interest rates, inflation, and so on. In a modern economy such as the UK, external factors often have more impact on inflation than domestic factors. Well, the Bank of England, when setting interest rates, has to be aware that most of the factors affecting inflation are not under its control. <clears throat> Pardon me. Two factors, yes, really important changes in the world prices of, of gas of crude oil, of hard metals, uh, et cetera. They are big supply side factors, but also the volatility of exchange rates, quite important. It comes to causes of inflation. If you think about Turkey, for example, the, the, the collapse in the lira causing inflation of 50% or more. Um, in many countries, the, the exchange rate is a, a major cause of inflationary pressure because it increases the cost of imports. Well done on that. If it's okay with you, just to finish with, I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about quantitative easing because it's something that students do have a little bit of trouble with. Um, I won't take you through how it works. I think you can advise that. Just this chart shows the scale of it. It's absolutely remarkable. Um, that, that QE came in in 2009 and uh, shot up. Well, at the start of the pandemic, it was 640, 450, I think, 445. By the end of 2020, it was up to 895. It's stayed at that level ever since. It's just starting to come down, but that's a huge amount of quantitative easing. And actually, what I've done on the next slide is I've just added together a little chart from the FT showing who owns UK government bonds. And for many, many years, it was the insurance companies and the pension funds, the dominant owners. Overseas investors, yes. But then look at, look at the blue line there. From 29 onwards, the Bank of England became 
a major buyer with QE. Here's a stat for you for the exam on Monday. In 2021, the Bank of England uh, held one third, one third of all UK government bonds. The scale of quantitative easing, the Bank of England is now a major owner of bonds. Now, what I want to do is do a little evaluation exercise with you. Uh, let's think about the costs, the benefits and the costs of QE. So one more chance to shine here. Can you, show, you know, put in some advantages, please, of an increase in quantitative easing for an economy? Have a go. Okay, some great answers coming through here. Hopefully you picked up some good ones. Um, come to Josh's answer in a second. I did spot Nabisha making a brilliant point, saying that it helps to overcome the liquidity trap. That kind of use of concepts brings gladness to my heart. Joshua has an amazing point. It increases the price of bonds, which lowers their yields. Therefore, the mega, whatever, the mega choppy chip shop <laughs> can bring new debt to market for cheaper borrowing. Of course, that, that chip in Coventry is going to need to um, uh, to have a huge effect on the global investment in the next 12 months. There we go. Abisha says it overcomes the liquidity trap. Basically, you've cut interest rates to zero. You, you, you reduce interest to very low levels, but it's not having much effect on demand. And this is why they brought in the unconventional policy of, um, of uh, QE. Sochi comes in with a great point. Mark Carney, a quote from the, Mark Carney, now gone, of course, 120 million QE is equivalent to a 1% increase in interest rates. I think it should be 120 billion QE, probably. It helps protect against the liquidity trap. Alby has a great point. Alby Stacey, able to enhance monetary policy to overcome the liquidity trap. Other benefits include effects on currency, lending, borrowing costs, and wealth and bond prices. The technical expertise in this group is staggering. Can I just give you my three points? First of all, it does incre increase the liquidity of commercial banks because the Bank of England is buying bonds off the banks, that's long-term assets, the banks are getting cash in exchange, then that allows them to lend more to businesses. It does reduce bond yields. Don't worry if you find that a bit technical, but the Bank of England basically is a big buyer of bonds. That causes the price of bonds to go up, which brings the yield down on bonds, which makes it cheaper for the government to borrow money. It also makes it cheaper to get a mortgage because the mortgage is, takes its lead from bond yields. And thirdly, really importantly, I think a few people mentioned this in the, in the chat. Sorry, um, Vav says, what are bond yields? I'll mention them tomorrow, actually, in my fiscal policy session. Bond yield is the interest rate the government has to pay on, on the new debt it issues. Third point, a couple of people mentioned this. Uh, quantitative easing can cause the exchange rate to fall. They're creating all this money in the economy. Some of it leaves the economy. Some of it goes to investments in Polish property or Malawian potatoes, whatever it is. If it leaves the economy, that can cause the exchange rate to depreciate, which then acts as a boost, a lift to exporters. Someone was asking what the liquidity trap is, and Robert Buxton comes in with a really, really helpful question, really helpful point, which is it's where interest rates are so low and an increase in the money supply has no effect on the economy. Basically, people don't respond anymore to cheaper money. Um, because they lack confidence on the this worried about the economy, for example. Final question. We're doing really well. Uh, over to you on the last one. What about the drawbacks? Give me some risks and drawbacks of an increase in QE. Have a go. Thank you. Okay, uh, quite a few people saying the big risk of QE is hyperinflation. Jay Cartwright, one of our great followers, our loyal 
watches, and obviously a superb economist, Jay talks about the distortion and the allocation of capital. I might talk about that in a second or two. Uh, some great answers coming through. Uh, let me take you through my uh, suggestions here. Okay, so one is QE can lead to a surge in property prices. It does, by the way. A lot of the QE has gone into, a lot of the lending has gone into mortgage lending, particularly things like buy to let and things. And there's some strong evidence, by the way, QE has increased both property and share prices by quite a bit. Well, share prices going up, in theory, is not a problem. But property prices, yes, it's good for your wealth if you, if you own a house, but clearly has a damaging effect on affordability and linked to that geographic mobility because the cost of renting has gone up as well. Second point, ultra low interest rates kept low by QE distort the allocation of capital and keep alive zombie companies. So this is now that QE is basically provided this wall of money, cheap money, and it's allowed a lot of businesses who would otherwise go to the wall in a recession to keep refinancing their existing debts. So they stagger, they stagger along desperately trying to survive from one month to the next. And uh, that's what's called a zombie company. Has anybody got any examples of zombie companies that they might want to type into the chat window? Um, yeah, Albi talks about malinvestment. If you have very low interest rates, some investment projects that really oughtn't to go ahead in normal times get, get given the go ahead. And that can also be a, a distorted allocation of capital. Ah, uh, yes, I thought, yeah, I thought Eddie would mention Chew to Chew as a zombie company. And Binley's mega chippy seems to be making regular appearances. Uh, the, the difference between the two is one is an amazing, amazing uh, business with incredible loyal support. And the other is the is the chippy in Coventry. Olivia misguided could be a zombie company. It could indeed. And the other one is 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 inflation. Now, don't don't go over the top in the exam on this. QE is not going to cause hyperinflation in the UK. I don't think so. But it could cause it could be contributing to inflation because the, the banks are now so full of deposits uh, that and, and they, that is going to contribute to higher inflation at some point in the future, particularly if we have some supply shortages, which we know we have on the supply side. So a rise in liquidity at some point risks causing a surge in inflation. Maybe we're seeing that now, although most of the inflation seems to be external in in um, in the long run. Laffy says Man City is an example of a zombie company. I think it's a really good application. Love that. Um, <laughs> okay. Last point, last slide. You've done amazingly well and hugely thank thanks to everybody for their contributions. Uh, macro policies are linked. So this was a session on monetary policy. Next up, fiscal and then supply side. Hopefully these three sessions will be useful for you, but they're linked. They're not separate policies. Monetary policy is a demand side policy that seeks to influence the level and growth of demand and control inflation. Fine. But we know the interest rate changes affect and exchange rate changes affect the supply side. They affect costs. They affect investment. Uh, they affect uh, in, inflows and outflows of, of money into the economy. So monetary policy does have a supply side effect. And uh, it often links the other way. Supply side affects the monetary policy, whether the Bank of England is willing or able to raise interest rates, for example. So keep in mind, everybody, that these policies are linked. It's quite important. There we go. I think we have 30 seconds. Uh, maybe if the production team can pick up a couple of questions, if there's any other questions, uh, I will try and address. Here's a question from Alex. Jeff, you say that the reason inflation is high is due to cost push, not demand for inflation. So increasing interest rates won't fully reduce inflation. That is, Alex, dare I say it, a superb evaluation point. If, if the main cause of inflation is on the supply side and external, then interest rates are not, not going to have much effect on inflation at all. And therefore, they'll be less effective. And uh, so you risk causing a recession without necessarily bringing inflation down. So thank you for that question, Alex. You, you hit on a great evaluation point. Dan S2302, why can't the Bank of England sell their bonds from QE in conjunction with increasing interest rates? Will this not have favourable in, in outcomes? Uh, selling their bonds, uh, oh yeah, they could do, they could do. Um, keep in mind, of course, that the Bank of England gets quite a lot of interest from bonds, actually. And uh, if they have been buying bonds off the bank, it's actually largely, it's a lot of money flowing into the Bank of England from the interest on that. 
but it could have favorable outcomes. Uh, can that liquidity trap be valuation to QE effectiveness? In a way, yes, Shivan. Uh, QE was brought in partly because people feared that interest rates would have less effect, low interest rates would have less effect on the economy. You could make a case for saying that a decade of QE is kind of, you're getting diminishing returns to QE. Maybe QE is becoming less effective, in which case at some point in the future, you'll have to be relying on cutting interest rates. And to do that, they have to go up first. So if interest rates go up to, let's say, 2 3 4% by the end of 2023, I think most people could live with that. But it, that would, it would then allow the Bank of England to reduce interest rates if and when we then hit the next recession or the next slowdown. And maybe time for one more. Here's a question from Ashir. When discussing interest rates, should you talk about the effect on hot money flows or focus on effects on consumption and investment? Great question to finish with. The answer is both. Interest rates, undoubtedly, relative interest rates affect hot money flows and therefore the exchange rate. So the key there, I think, Ashir, is to talk about relative policy rates between the UK versus the states, the Eurozone and the Bank of Japan, for example. But clearly, interest rates also have a domestic effect on the cost of borrowing, mortgages, home loans, uh, car loans and things, and business investment loans. So always try to bring in the exchange rate if you get a question on the impact of changes in interest rates. Megan asks a very important question. Where did you or where do you get your haircut? Well, Megan, let me answer that question. I have my own personal hairdresser. Uh, please keep this to yourself. Do not spread this. But my hairdresser is called Marco uh, and he is a very talented man. He charges me five pounds for a haircut, five pounds plus a 300 pound search fee. And I, I go to him every time. On that note, well, uh, thank you to everybody for their contributions. We have some more sessions lined up ahead of paper two on Monday. If you're watching this after the exam, hope it went well. Uh, check out the YouTube channel. If you like the session, click like and uh, subscribe so you get to know when all the new sessions are. We're gonna build in a few more in the coming days. Huge thanks to everybody for their amazing contributions on the live stream. We've got very talented economists in this group, hundreds of them. Take care, stay safe, stay positive, stay happy, and see you soon.